Uh, this is uh, Brenda Randolph, and I'm the chair of the Children's Africana Book Award. And I would like to welcome you to the final Global Read webinar for this school year. Uh, be sure to bookmark the Global Reading Across Cultures website and check for future webinars. The Global Read webinar series is sponsored by the Consortium of Latin American Studies Programs, the South Asia National Outreach Consortium, the Middle East Outreach Council, and the African Studies Outreach Council. Each of these world area programs gives annual awards for outstanding children and young adult books. The awards include the Americas Awards, the Middle East Outreach Council Award, the South Asia Book Award, or SABA, and the Children's Africana Book Award, known as CABA. Funding is provided by the National Resource Center Program of the U.S. Department of Education under Title VI. To learn more about National Resource Centers, go to internationalizingsocialstudies.wordpress.com. After this webinar, you will receive an online post-participation survey. We'd like your feedback, so please complete the survey. Tonight's webinar is sponsored by the Outreach Council of the African Studies Association. In 1991, the Outreach Council, in collaboration with Africa Access, founded CABA and presented the first award in 1992. This past November, CABA celebrated 25 years of presenting awards to authors and illustrators of outstanding books on Africa for children and young adults. There are three award categories, young children, older readers, and our newest category, new adult, which recognizes books published for adult audiences, but suitable for mature teens. The CABA Awards Committee just announced the 2018 winners. We invite you to read these award-winning books, add them to your school and public library collections, and give them to family and friends. Visit the CABA webpage on africaaccessreview.org of the website to learn about these and other CABA winners. Joining us tonight all the way from Kenya, is Kenyan writer Major Mwangi, author of the 2006 Kaba winner, The Mzungu Boy. Also joining us is Wambui Githiora Updike, our moderator. Major Mwangi is one of Kenya's leading novelists. He is the winner of the Jomo Kenyatta Prize for Literature, mentioned in the International Dublin Literary Award and the Lotus Prize for Literature. He has published 15 novels, numerous children's books, short stories, and a variety of film projects. The Mzungu Boy has been translated into eight languages. Wambui Githiora Updike has worked in the field of education and international development with a special focus on teaching English and African literature. She retired last June from the Cambridge Ringe and Latin School um, High School in Cambridge, Massachusetts where she introduced a variety of curriculum and taught a senior level course in African literature for 15 years. She graduated with a BA in literature from the University of Nairobi and later studied at the University of Kansas and earned an EDD degree in international education development from Teachers College, Columbia University. And now I'd like to introduce uh, from Boston, uh, Wambui Githiora Updike. Good evening, everyone. And what a pleasure it is today, this evening in Boston, for me to be introducing one of the most admired Kenyan writers, Major Mwangi, uh, a man I have not met yet, although I'm meeting him today on, online, but who is well known to me and to our family because he is not only a very special Kenyan writer who has 
over the years been able to reach very many people, including the, a non-traditional group of readers who sometimes did not have access to the type of literature that he has focused on. He has, he has um, over the years, he has introduced people to young characters, urban people from the, from the countryside, but also from the urban areas. He has focused on themes that are very relevant to a young Kenyan, young Kenyan people growing up in the 1970s. I know that my brothers and older sister were very, very interested in his work and would never share the books with me during the holidays. So it was always a little problem because our schools did not always have the books available. So it is a wonderful pleasure. And I must also add that Major Mwangi's wife, Caroline Wanjiko, is also from my home village of Mangu. So this is a double pleasure. And welcome to all the listeners, wherever you are, to, 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 to discuss a truly wonderful novel, The Muzungu Boy. This is, and, to, and as I would like also like to remind you as you listen to the discussions that are, will ensue, to please write your, any questions you may have for Meiji Mwangi. Um, and the, the place to write these questions or comments or observations will be near at the chat windows. Use your chat window at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And now, Meiji Mwangi, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll start by talking a little bit about my hometown. Uh, as you have said, uh, you've spoken about myself and uh, the, most of the details about my beginnings and all that I, in, the, in the, my biography at the back of the book. Old timers in my hometown of Nanyuki still remember Queen Elizabeth's visit to Nanyuki hours after her father's death in 1952. There were marching bands and soldiers and a lot of people waving flags. Uh, she stopped to shake hands and seeing how, seeing how much the people loved her, she ordered the governor to grant each of her natives 20 acres and two cows. She also ordered clean water and free electricity and respect for her native subjects. Some may say she was not a queen then, so that she could not have ordered the government to do such things. But this is how our old timers like to remember it. But after she left Nanyuki town, her white subjects surrounded her black subjects with barbed wire fences and uh, made a concentration camp out of our uh, village. The governor said it was to protect us from terrorists. It was said Mau Mau were going about armed with machetes, trying to drive white people out of the country. Historians will also probably uh, reject our telling of it, but this is how old timers like to remember it. What has this got to do with the Mzungu boy? Uh, you see that in a moment. Nanyuki town, uh, which is based uh, at the base of Mount Kenya, in the heart of colonial occupation, uh, was founded by the British colonial settlers as a shopping and administrative uh, center. It was a business and administration, an administration center for the Nuki district. That was just over a century ago. It was divided in uh, separate parts for, for the Europeans, the Asians, and Africans. This segregation, segregation was by law. The town center was in two parts. The main street with the Europeans, uh, shops and businesses, was for Europeans only. Behind the main street was the Asian section, which was for Asians only. Uh, the shops and buildings were owned by Asians. Europeans could shop at either, but Asians could only do business in the Asian section. Africans could shop at Asian stores or at their own shops inside Majengo. Majengo was the, Majengo was the, the African location of town. Uh, it was more or less like a slum of tin roofs and mud walls. It was built as a labor pool for settler farmers. 
Um, it had mud roads at the beginning. The electricity came later, which you see there came later. And it was where most of the hands that worked in the farms and ranches of Balaikipia came from. It was huge, self-contained place with its own shops, its own uh, church, uh, its own uh, mosque, schools, and uh, completely self-contained. The buildings were square blocks uh, in what were called plots. Each building uh, would uh, house about four families one in front and one behind, so that each plot would uh, hold probably about 10 families. All in all, when it, when it was fully occupied, it had about 20,000 people in, in the same, living in the same place. The houses were built of mud and tin roofs, uh, which the neighbors joined hands in building. The population was diverse. It came from all over East Africa, all the way from Aden to Malawi. Uh, people looking for employment in the white farms. There was room for all kinds of people, all kinds of cultures. People lived in harmony under difficult conditions. But due to the diversity of the people, the language most spoken was Kiswahili, which was uh, the, the language of the coastal parts of Kenya and is now the language of all of East Africa, the official language of all of East Africa. There was no pipe to water. The, res the residents depended on harvesting rainwater and buying water from water sellers uh, who brought water from water points uh, one water point was switched at the center of town. This is where I grew up in this Majengo, in this place of different cultures, different peoples. This is where I, grew, I was born, grew up here, and went to school here. And this is where the, our main character in the Mzungu boy also went to school. My playground, unlike his, was on the dusty open fields between the plots. My weekends was spent playing with the wire truck, wire trucks, or playing a rug ball with other boys. The only outing was exploring the back lanes and visiting friends in their plots. Karaoke school experiences were not much different from mine. I his struggles to be on the right side with the teachers and the parents are my own. Monday was the most difficult day at school. From, from roll call to inspection to class was one long and painful day. Arriving late to school, all with the dirty fingers and uncombed hair, unfinished homework uh, were all punishable offenses. I remember arriving a couple of minutes late, soaking wet, after running three whole miles from home in the rain and being punished for being late. I never went in the rain to school after that. I stayed home to face the music the following day. There were lots of uh, stray dogs in my jungle, uh, but I never had one of my own. We hardly had enough to eat ourselves. So feeding us was out of the question. Some of the classmates, those who lived on settlers' farms, like Karaoke, had dogs and went hunting on weekends with the dogs. Their dogs were named Jimmy too. And it was from them that I got the finer points of hunting, what hogs. Like hunting and fishing, like hunting, fishing required a license, but boys did not know or care. There was fish in the river, and so they fished. In the Mzungu boy, karaoke is a loner. 
He spends his time alone exploring the river through the village. He is forbidden to catch fish, enter the forest, or to walk the river bank beyond the village until the day he meets the Mzungu boy by the river fishing and realize they have many things in common. They exchange knowledge about who, what, and how things work, uh, where the Mzungu boy comes from and how he lives. And from the Mzungu boy, Kariuki learns to fish. From him, the Mzungu boy learns to hunt. Their families do their best to keep them apart uh, on short leashes. But the boys, the Mzungu boy is not allowed to leave his grandmother's porch. Kariuki must not leave his mother's compound. He must stop playing with the white boy or inviting him to the house. The family is afraid um, out of lack of uh, uh, communication or knowledge or awareness. His father is genuinely afraid that the Mzungu boy might die from eating uh, what Kariuki eats. But the spirit of adventure is greater than than any threats of punishment or fear of danger. The boy goes to Kariuki's place and eats there. They go out fishing and hunting regardless of the consequences. They ignore orders to cross the river and eventually go deep in the forest that is, so, uh, that is not safe to go to. Inside the forest are the feared Mau Mau, sworn enemies of the white settlers the ones that the governor talked about. The boys refuse to obey their parents' orders to stay out, to, to be separated, and create an uncertain bridge between their families and their cultures. The Mzungu boy gets to experience African food at Kariuki's house to the amazement and amusement of the villagers. Kariuki in turn is invited for tea. These are the beginnings of understanding and perhaps the end of mutual mistrust. But still there was a war going on. The war, a war that the boys were not aware of. One major operation by the British Army, again is the Mau Mau, was codenamed Operation Handbill. Hundreds were rounded up and detained. There were mass arrests and imprisonments. Villagers were caught between the hammer and the anvil. The army wanted information. The Mau Mau demanded support. Villages were, villages were burned down. People disappeared. Whichever side of the village, of the villagers, uh, this, uh, the, the people were on, they were severely punished by the other side. There was no safe place to be. Those who informed on the Mau Mau paid a heavy price, and those who did not were detained or imprisoned. Unable to withstand the pressure, many farm workers fled, fled their farm jobs to join the Mau Maus in the forest. Others stole food, medicine, and ammunition from their white masters and brought them to the freedom fighters. Settlers armed themselves. Again, it's the, the, they are found, the, they armed themselves again is their own. And against this fearful background, the boys were able to form a friendship. Teachers may want to consider Mzungu boys and the adventure story of two boys drawn together by their own curiosity about each other and about uh, the world around them. The decision to cross the forest, the forest of the plains, to go after the biggest and the fiercest warthog in the land shows their spirit and determination. In their innocence, they are unaware of the social tensions and political tensions around them. The land politics and racial issues have ignited war between the army and the Mau Mau freedom fighters. War is going on in the forest 
or and all around the villages as the boys go about their adventure. Teachers may also want to consider how when the boys go missing, uncertainty and fear affects everyone at the farm equally. When I wrote this book, I was uh, I was uh, back in my hometown, Nanyuki, and uh, remembering how I grew up, and uh, also realizing that the, the 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 children who were children of the settlers at the time that I was growing up were now also grown up and still living in the same farms, and I imagine what it must have been like for them to have to deal with the with the fears and the pains and the uncertainty of the time as I had to deal with it because I grew up during that time too. In my own home there was always talk of people wandering in the forest whose names we were not supposed to mention. In fact they were called people of the forest or they were called the night bushes or something like that. I, because if you named them, if you mention the word Mau Mau, you are in danger of being arrested for knowing something about their whereabouts, or also you being attacked by the Mau Mau for 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 corroborating with the with the soldiers and so on. But uh, I also remember after. It was over just before independence when it was declared that the, the war had been won or, or lost and it, there was no more fighting in the forest. Somebody who was supposed to be my uncle, I didn't know him, like a lot of children didn't know their relatives who had gone into the forest as young men uh, to become freedom fighters until they came out at the end of the, of the, of the fighting. Uh, there was an uncle who came to visit our house one evening, and the whole evening we sat around the fire, enthralled by the stories he told of his exploits in the forest, in the forest, facing up to the much better armed British with a single rifle and a single bullet or something like that. And uh, the, those stories stuck in my mind. And uh, I found them very fascinating and very intriguing. So when I came to, to thinking about the uncertainty of the past in the, in the, in the farmlands around Anyuki, uh, that also came into my, uh, my plotting of the story, whereby uh, Kariuki's brother, after enduring many, many months, even years of working for the white settlers, decides to go, finally decides to go into the forest and, uh, and face the soldiers with the Mau Mau. So that those parts of the story are, are from uh, more or less personal experiences. Uh, the Mzungu boy, has won several awards for the uh, the German uh, Youth Literature Award. Uh, there was a French one uh, whose name I can't remember, and has been translated into uh, seven, six, seven languages uh, from uh, German, French, Swedish, uh, even Korean and Portuguese. Now, there are questions of, or comments, we can go from there. Hello. Hello. Um, can I pick an email? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Major Mwangi, because what a fascinating uh, background. And for every listener here today, I think this will be very, very important historical background 
and also the, so that the details in this most exciting and riveting book uh, will be clearer. And it's especially wonderful for teachers to have to, let, to be able to listen to you and to see these very well done uh, visuals that would accompany any any uh, the examination of this of this this book with their with their students. So thank you very much for that. And it brings back this story that has been touched by other writers. But I really think that the strength of your novel has has to do with the fact that this is a very unlikely scenario that happens. It's very real, very real, and very well rendered. So once again, thank you for bringing this book to the attention of teachers. And I am especially sorry that I didn't have the opportunity to teach this book to my own students, but I'm going to be to make sure that other, other students in the Cambridge Public School system uh, read uh, this novel with their class, the teachers read with their, with their, with their students. And, and, and of course, the, the public library already, I have known that, has, has the books, has the book itself. And I encourage every listener today to ask their libraries, uh, public libraries and school libraries to bring this book so that uh, every young young man and young woman can read um, Muzungu Boy. Um, I have a few questions for you, uh, Major. And you have you have touched on quite a number of what I we had prepared I had prepared, but I had the first question was, what was the genesis of your writing, uh, and do you have early memories of being a storyteller? Is a um, a voracious reader or whatever books of other reading material available to you, and being a student who enjoyed writing class compositions. Did you have an adult in your family or school who helped you to develop your writing gift? Um, you, I don't know if it's too, maybe too long, but you can address, you can touch on whichever part um, makes sense to you. I'll try, I'll try to, to touch on all the parts. Mm -hmm. uh, I started uh, writing quite early in life. Mm -hmm. My first experience with the writing was with the, I visited an old relative again, and a relative uh, uh, who, was, uh, very, who was actually starting to learn to read. Um, <laughs> he, 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 at an old age, you could say, an adult uh, uh, student. Mm -hmm. And he was learning by correspondence. Uh, I was visiting during the hol the holidays. I saw the books that had been sent to him uh, to start to learn to read and write. Mm -hmm. And I went through them uh, during my holidays, and I was so so excited about the idea that I could understand these stories. That uh, from that point, I started thinking I could also tell my own stories. Mm -hmm. So when I went to school. When I started, I was quite young actually at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started school, uh, I could not go to the normal school because uh, there was a law that for a kid to go to school, the father had to pay heart tax. Mm -hmm. And my father, I had, I had no father, my father was dead. Mm -hmm. So I could not go to normal school. I had to go to a kind of uh, community school where we spent time just learning the ABCs and accounting and the, not really a proper school. Mm -hmm. And most uh, days, the teachers uh, just took us outside and sat us under a tree. And for lack of what to do with us, asked if anybody had a story, he or she could tell the rest. Mm -hmm. And I started retelling the stories I had read from the books, The Old Man had let me read, the old man who was learning to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, then from there, the, the, the audience got so excited about the stories, mm -hmm. I started making up my okay. stories. And I became like the class and the school storyteller. Uh -huh. Then when I went on ahead in school, then uh, finally, you know, when the, the, the war in the forest ended and then it didn't matter, and every kid could go to school. Mm -hmm. When I started going to school, 
and learned to really put words together, I started writing those stories. And uh, I was probably about uh, 11 by then or 12 or something like that. And I continued writing those stories. Yeah, I continued writing those stories until uh, I was in class uh, seven. And that is when I read my first real book. Uh, not just children's stories, but real novels. Okay. Uh, it was Ngogi Watsiongo's Weep No Child. Oh, okay. When I read it, I, I, I decided that if he could make a book that I was thinking of make, I didn't know anything about publishing or anything like that. Mm -hmm. If he could make a book, I could also make one myself, which was very ambitious at that age, and from where I came from. Oh. So I started writing a book about the Mau Mau, the stories I had heard from my uncles and relatives and neighbors and so on. Mm -hmm. I started working on that book. And uh, I worked on it through uh, class seven and through secondary school. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to high school, um, I asked uh, my brother to help me get up publish. I was really ambitious. That I want to make to see this book in print. And uh, he did his best, but uh, it wasn't so successful. But much a few years later, under mm -hmm. my own steam, I was able to contact um, Heinemann African Writers Series, who are the main publisher. Mm -hmm. And uh, the editor was uh, very generous to <laughs> He went through the book mm -hmm. and he, he, wrote a, he wrote a nice report. And uh, when I called him, he told me it was uh, okay, but needed a lot of work. <laughs> he was being okay. very, very gentle and very friendly. Mm -hmm. So I was very excited. Somebody likes my story, somebody outside my classmates. Because when I was in high school, all my classmates helped me type it. We had a typewriter in class mm -hmm. and we took turns typing the story. So, How was the book? Your first, first book? That was uh, called Taste of Death. I, it's no longer in a... Okay, Taste of Death. Taste of Death. That's history. If you get a copy, don't <laughs> read it. It's rather embarrassing. <laughs> no, but, but, but it's also been a wonderful attempt that the Heinemann people actually, the, the, the reader, gave you this encouragement. And that is a very good thing for, for him to have done, or him or her, to have done this. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's that's the point at which I would have probably, although I don't think I would have given up, I was just so so much into storytelling, I would not have given up. But that was a point where, that would have been the lowest point if he had said it was utter rubbish, which he could have said. Wonderful. But uh, he didn't. He was a good man. Very nice. So, and listening to this i think this would be quite a way for them to encourage their students to keep writing because there's always a kid in a class who has the idea that he or she can write and would like and you the teacher might notice that through their essays or their responses to different uh questions in any way be it in whatever subject so it, it, as as students who are going to be reading your book and uh the students of any of the teachers here but here present I'm sure that autobiographical piece can be very encouraging. And I myself am encouraged by the fact that you were writing at such an early age and that your uncle or your relative is a person who, through his correspondence classes, because I'm familiar with that, I knew a few people even much later, I guess, who, were, who couldn't go to high schools who are doing correspondence classes. So that's uh, uh, one feature of, uh, I guess, post-colonial Kenya that I hadn't actually thought about it until just now, as you talked about that. Yeah. yeah I, for, I forgot yeah. to mention when I was in high school, mm -hmm. uh, most of our teachers were American Peace Corps. Uh -huh. And uh, my English teacher was an American Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote a short story. He, he asked us to write short stories. Mm -hmm. And he was so excited about it. And he gave me such a high mark. And uh, 
that, that, that was, went a long way towards encouraging me to keep uh, telling stories. That, that, is a, that is a wonderful, and again, what a teacher can do to, to make or unmake a, a, a young person's uh, dream, you know, to, or, to, or to not maybe completely stop it, but to perhaps stall it for a while. Which, which leads me to another question I, want, I wanted to find out about. Um, I wanted to make a, um, a comment about, and, and because now that the, the, the listeners know about the, the violence that was pervasive in the time period when this novel is said, I was interested in how, what your views were, are on the, the violence that you very well depict. Sometimes karaoke is often hit, right? Sometimes, of course, with the beating he gets at school, and you addressed that earlier on. Uh, he's also hit by Harry, his brother, sometimes, you know, like a, you know, just knock on the head. And I even actually have memories of a little bit of that, that John, uh, in homes and at schools. People, I know myself, we were definitely beaten in school for this or that, making noise, not studying, not homework done, etc. That was a very, it was a, um, I think it was a remnant of the colonial system of education where they thought, I guess they thought children could only be beaten, uh, could learn if they were beaten. Uh, and they, they, they have the teachers carried on that tradition. Um, I wanted to, to you to make a comment. Is there a connection, in your opinion, between the brutalization of a colonized population and this treatment of children who are the most vulnerable members of society? If you, if you think about uh, it. But there was at that time. There was a bit of that. Uh, mm. To begin with, the, the school system being uh, British, mm -hmm. and you know they have a saying about uh, uh, sparing the child and <laughs> spoiling the rod, or something yeah. like. That. Mm -hmm. And spoil the child. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Spare the rod and spare the child. Mm -hmm. uh, that that was standard, and uh, no one saw anything wrong with it. The, it was normalized. And even parents, mm -hmm. it was now more yes. That they, if um, a child was just went way out of line, he would be told to go and bring his own parents or her own parents, mm -hmm. and they would be there when they were, when the child was punished, or they would be asked to do the punishment himself, themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when the children went home, they were sent home for being bad. The first thing that happens is the parents disciplined them, and that was so the way of disciplining them. And then, they got a double beating. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. They got it twice, if not three times. <laughs> once yeah. before, once mm -hmm. after school and going back. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was standard. But during that time of... Uh, of uh, they called it troubles or they called it war. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody was under tension. The parents under a lot of tension, yeah, and uh, consequently they, they they were impatient and also they took out the anger sometimes on the on their mm -hmm. children uh, mm -hmm. when they didn't do the right thing. Yeah, so that also, that also was spread throughout the community. Yeah, that's right. I uh, I. And yet, despite all this and the, the hardship and everything, your novel contains one of the most interesting, lively, and moving experiences of friendship between two boys who, in spite of race and social political realities, like a Goy boy and a British boy in colonial Kenya, meet and become friends and fellow adventurers on the open grasslands and plains during a tense and dangerous moment in Kenya. And the reader soon realizes that the unfettered open land has the power to unleash the joy of life in these young boys. And, and, and my question was, although I think you addressed it earlier, but what was, inspired, what was it that inspired you to create these two characters? But I think you told us about that because you understood that even the Muzungu children themselves were at the, they were in Nanyuki and in environs at the very same time. Um, but I, but I was, I wanted, I wondered what you might think about a comment about the same land. This land, uh, it's giving these children 
the, the, the joy of discovery and friendship and adventure. And yet it's an occupied land. It's a it's stolen land because many of the places you're going to, that the children are going to are, I, unless I'm wrong, they are part of the large farms that had been appropriated. Am I correct in that? You're correct. That's uh, almost the thing a is, irony here. You, you know. it, it is, it is. But the thing is that even when I was growing up mm -hmm. and uh, we had uh, relatives working in the farms and so on and all that, mm -hmm. uh, when we went to visit there as children or mm -hmm. as young people, we had no feeling that it was stolen land or mm -hmm. occupied land for that matter. Mm -hmm. For us, the fascination with the, with the with the world, with the being, with the with the wildlife, mm -hmm. uh, did not include the the feeling that somebody had taken it away from somebody else because it was still free. It's the <laughs> same way with the with the Mzungu boy and karaoke. They, mm -hmm. they don't know whose land it is. They don't know where the boundaries are, and it doesn't matter as long as they are free to explore mm -hmm. and to enjoy and to to live in it. Adventure. One, yeah, that's a, and, and that comes very, for those who are listening who haven't yet read the book, that really is one of the, the most wonderful um, features of this book, aspects of this book, because I can, I can actually see that many, many children in the countries where this book has already been translated must really think this is one of the best books they have written because it, it celebrates childhood and friendship and and that sort of age of innocence if you for lack of a better term to call it where and then the, these animals are fascinating and and I, I i had another question about animals in particular because um the, the protagonist the, the the you 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 depict the animals the dogs and the another and the and the big uh, what's the, what's the big one there the warthog old mosses uh, and the village dogs, they, the Jimmies. This was one of the my most one of the favorite scenes I was reading about because you you the element of the, uh, the literary device of personification really comes alive in these animals. They talk, the boys talk to them. They each each side understands the other, and um, they are unforgettable. And I, I, I would like to quote something that in your own words about old Moses, old Moses, the warthog. Quote your words, almost as big as a buffalo. His huge, strangely curved saber tusks were amber brown, and they swept out of the sides of his mouth and curved forwards, outwards and upwards, for almost a foot on either side of his head. And this is a very exciting thing. And as I say these things, I'm seeing the the, the 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 visual of old workshop right here so thank you for that as for me I'm, I, I must say I really thank you for this writing uh, but the dogs are notable for their ability to understand what is going on with their human friends and I think that many students reading Muzungu boy will be reminded of their own canine friends and other animal friends many kids uh, children across the world, I love that love their pets, you know, whether it's pet rabbits or pet whatever. Uh, did you have an, your own Jimmy? Your, did you have an old your own Jimmy as you were growing up? You know, your own dog? Mm -hmm. No, no, I still have one. Yeah, but, but you, I, had, have... I had a cousin who had a whole herd of them, a mm -hmm. whole army of dogs, <laughs> and. Uh, they were the most unruly gang of uh, mongrels one could imagine. But they obeyed him uh -huh. and they did everything he said. Mm -hmm. And uh, so from that I learned that the dogs have got personalities too. Mm -hmm. And that if you leave them with them long enough, long enough, you may begin to understand them and they understand you. Okay. That's a really good point. And I want to, I'm going to say one last thing uh, that you may respond to. But before I do so, I'd like to remind everybody listening, I'd like you to, to encourage you to write any question, comment, or observation 
in your chat windows at the bottom right hand corner of your screen in case you came into the webinar uh, after I made that first um, announcement. Um, my last question to you is um, if you have any advice or suggestions for teachers and school districts across the United States who wish to, to, to teach Muzungu Bo in their classes or to send us holiday and, and birthday gifts to young adults, to, to the young adults uh, or even grown up family members. Do you have any comments that you might want to add to them or, or shall we, yeah? Or, I would say to, or, to uh -huh, you'd say, mm -hmm. I would say to approach it as a, as an adventure story for boys. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And uh, also it could be if it, they are so inclined, approach mm -hmm. it as a, as a historical or a history lesson mm -hmm. on uh, a, a small history lesson on colonialism mm -hmm. and uh, division of people by uh, racial tensions and differences and mm -hmm. the politics and the politics mm -hmm. yeah. and i think that you know because teachers obviously teachers uh, who are listening here are already thinking quite hard about how they would approach the teaching of this book but i would recommend that they follow this advice that you have given to them but also to look at this book from a writing point of view uh, when students are, are being introduced to understanding literary terminology it has what I think with vivid prose, it has uh, it has um, personification. You're teaching it, a teacher wanted to teach personification to an entire class. We just use these dogs as uh, you know, and 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 the warthog, and then the friendship between boys, friendship between children, uh, and this, especially in this country, across the racial divide, for example, because sometimes that does not necessarily happen particularly when kids reach high school. They, I, I've been teaching high school for a long time and I, I, it used to surprise me to see kids that I thought had didn't even know each other. And suddenly I would see them laughing away and talking on the corridor and they would say, oh, we've been together since kindergarten. But by high school, sometimes kids will separate into different you know, social groups and different, you know, different classes anyway and pursue different interests but that early childhood experience never fades and I think that is actually one of the biggest hopes uh, if you can say it that way for for the nation and for others anywhere in the world who sometimes don't believe that children can really really become friends and defy the adults and teach the adults because that's really what uh, the two boys do in the end the, the Muzungu landowner, the, the Buana, and his mother, and even and the boy, Jeroges, no, Karaoke's parents, they everybody begin really do, does understand that these boys are real friends, you know, and they and they will do every, anything for each other, you know, and they do actually in the book. So, um, you know, some of those, uh, uh, the children of the white settlers. Mm -hmm are still living on the same farms. You know, now they are grown up, of course, and uh, they mm -hmm. are interacting with the karaokes of the time mm -hmm. and uh, under totally different circumstances. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is quite relevant that uh, they move on and they step out of the time mm -hmm. and uh, the situation mm -hmm. and they become uh, different people. Mm -hmm. And yet they have that old memory of the farm that old farm, with even despite the divided loyalties they might have had, you know, through their families. You know. Absolutely, absolutely. Now they they interact like equals, and uh, that that's more or less history forgotten. Now they are different age, mm -hmm. and uh, no the friendship is now based on understanding and much. And coming yeah, to terms with that you exactly know, part of history. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this this has been a very, very wonderful, I must say it's wonderful, I'm very happy to hear your voice and to see these beautiful uh, pictures on my screen and to recall the, my, my happiness at reading this book. Uh, and now I think it's time for other people to 
I think it's time for other people to ask the questions or comments and observations they have. So for my part, I want to thank you very much. Yes. And now it's up to Thank other. you. Yes. So do I, do I yeah, do I read this one? So the question. Um, so they, they don't have any question. So do we, so far we don't see any question, but I wonder if anybody out there writing and listening has a question that they might like to ask Major Mwangi. But because if you don't, I might ask him another, but I think it would be nice for other people to, to participate as well. This one? Okay. Um, so um, while, while some people are, are organizing themselves, Major, I wanted to ask you, have you had any uh, reports or if, if anybody, I, I know I'm going to be very curious and I want to find out how the people, it, this book has been for the, for them, for the benefit of listeners, this book has been translated into Basque, German, French, Russian, and Japanese. And of course, the Mzungu boy won the prestigious Deutsche Jugen, I can't say all of this, Jugend Literature Prize when it was first, first published in 1990. Is that German? Is that from Germany? Jugen? That's from Germany, yes. Yeah, I, I think yeah. that's here. Yeah. Now, um, I wanted to ask whether, you have ha ha heard or received any comments or reports from the teachers working with this novel in their classrooms in any of these countries? Because that could be instructive oh, yeah. for, for the American teachers. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I was I invited was to, to many schools in Germany mm -hmm. and Switzerland. Okay. Where they, they also read and speak German okay. and uh, read and had discussions with the students in classes. And they seemed to be quite excited about the book. Okay. And did they, did you, do you think that their teachers were able to communicate effectively uh, the background, you know, the, the, the colonial story? I know they are very good educational systems wherever. So sometimes, but sometimes people don't cover this kind of colonial history, except maybe in very broad, you know, broad strokes. You know. The, the kids did Some of them, some of them were able to communicate the, the background, the okay. history of the, behind the story. Okay. But uh, and others were discovering it when uh, they invited me and we talked about it. Oh, good. Yeah. So it may very well be that some, school districts in this country in this country will be encouraged to have you speak to them to their students and their classes that is that would be no problem yeah that is something we should work toward because if i in fact um in in my old like a talking of um, you mentioned google area with no child and i used to teach that book and the and the students would be very 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 involved with that story of um um, the experiences of Joroge uh, in, in Whipno Child and his family and what happens to the land and, the, and they, they became very conscious of the, the history of colonization. But at the same time, some of them were studying early America and the col you know, colon colonial America and they were beginning to, to draw parallels between that and the experiences of the Native American people, you know, because of displacement from their, you know, original lands but I we have one we have a comment from Laura um, one of the listeners who says I don't have any questions but want to say thank you I've really enjoyed this session so if 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 Laura is listening uh, thank you for the comment thank you very much yes So I would, I would like to say a very big thank you, Major Mwangi, for this wonderful, enlightening and educational experience that you have provided for us. And I know that many teachers will be 
uh, very grateful to listen to you, even if they were not able to um, to participate today, and to take to heart and to into consideration the background story that you provide, which always makes it much much easier for a teacher to approach in it a new text, and especially text that is not immediately um, familiar to them. Should that be the case? So thank you very much. And there's um, <clears throat> Yes. Oh, yes, Brenda. Yes, I just. Well, should we? Yes, yeah, Brenda, uh, Major, and Major, hear me. Yes. Uh, there's a question. Still here. I can hear you. Yeah. How has the book been received in Kenya? That's another question from Brenda. Brenda. Yeah. Oh, how it has, has been received in Kenya? Mm. Very well, I would say. Very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's no system I know of teaching the history of the Mau Mau uh, at the moment. Did you hear that? Pandi? Oh, no, he says Sorry? that, no, uh, um, Major, they, she didn't hear right, but he's, uh, she's asking if you could repeat that, that it's been received I very well, but there's no... It has been received very well, yes. Mm -hmm. But I was going to add that uh, it's not as it should be part mm -hmm. of the teaching of the history of the mm -hmm. people of the country, you know, mm -hmm. of the history of colonialism and, uh, and all that. Mm -hmm. it, it's not been anything like that, but probably yeah. one day will be. And what that, and that's that's a real pity because this book, this is a very well, we'll, we'll find <laughs> there must be ways that this can be addressed. And sometimes, you know, it starts with them. Sometimes it starts with a few school districts determining, because because I do know that in Kenya there is a set curriculum for the, the books to be read. So sometimes that is the, that could be part of the, the problem. Maybe some people who, are, problem, setting, yeah. I, uh, who are setting these rules may not have read this book, because I think if they have, they would want it to be read by Kenyan kids, you know, in their own country. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But you know, there are times, you know, the old ad, you know, saying that a prophet is known except in his own country. And, you know, that could be the case and that there may be other, a lot of people who, everybody knows Major Mwangi, seriously, in Kenya, anyone who has read anything, especially starting from the, you know, from the 70s. But I think in terms of the power of this particular text and some of your other books, it will come, I believe. Because I know that they have taught some of your other, is it that they've taught, is it kill? No, have they taught Kill Me Quick? Kill or, Me Quick. Yeah, or Carcass for Hounds. Kill Me Quick, uh -huh. Carcass for Hounds as well. Carcass for Hounds, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Kill Me Quick and uh, and one or two others I forget. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that have been part of the curriculum. So perhaps this one, it, someone needs to, you know, encourage the, the, especially the younger grades for them. This would be an ideal book for standards um, seven and eight. Yeah. So that's that's something to be explored, and and also in the rest of Eastern Africa and other African countries as well. Yeah. So. That's right. Yes. I just I yeah. just saw a question flash on the screen. Teachers are not censored for talking about um, colonialism or colonial oh. times. It's, oh, yeah, it's just that uh, it's just that uh, the system of education is so structured here that anything not in the curriculum doesn't get uh, taught, mm -hmm. and uh, they are more into uh, sciences and uh, such than into Mm -hmm. that history mm -hmm. or the arts. Yeah, oh, and I think too, you are right about the rigidity of the curriculum because even though a book like this may be in a, a school library because of the, maybe a school headmistress or headmaster or a teacher would be very, would be able to provide a book like that in their own, in the library. It's about the revamping of the curriculum because it is taught throughout the land. And so maybe there's a lot of investment in holding on to certain books 
because that means only those books get to be read for a very long time and they don't want someone is not introducing or breathing or bringing in a different perspective on maybe even the same topic on the same time period yeah and especially for a different age group yeah so i'm not that sure i don't think i don't think it's complete censorship but it's also one could see that it's also keeping away the the a text such as this one that is very relevant you know yeah even in modern times yeah are there any more questions uh, out there to the listeners um uh, this is your opportunity to ask the author himself you know it would be wonderful but at the, on the, the other hand it could also be a comment or observation. It doesn't have to be a question. Yeah, so we have, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so I think this is a good moment for us to wrap up and to Say a big thank you to Major Mwangi and to, to, to keep in mind all the words that he has given us this afternoon, this evening, um, and to find a way to incorporate this text into your curriculum. And if I'm sure that if you need any um, teaching suggestions for the background, uh, political background, uh, this, the BU as a resource and those who are in Washington, the Harvard University Resource Center, and there are many others. I think Brenda can speak to that. Um, but there are many, you are seeing many, thank you. I'm an amazing experience and thank you for your time. It's been great by the different people listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's three o'clock in the morning here. Oh. <laughs> And I, I, I have really I enjoyed really, the evening. Oh, the morning. Good morning. <laughs> so we should say good morning, Maj. Good awesome. morning. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, here it's just eight, 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 five minutes past eight o'clock p.m. I know, I know. <laughs> oh, so you probably it's would sleep. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Now I go straight to work. There's no, no need to go back to bed. Straight to work. Whoa. <laughs> I hope yeah. you went to up later on but this is yeah well this has been a, a real pleasure and Same and, a and a privilege indeed thank you very much goodbye thank you for inviting me goodbye mm -hmm. and have a good afternoon good evening yeah you as well and uh, salimia water greet everybody in kenya eh? uh, <laughs> for us I'll do thank that you. thank you thank you everyone okay.